Because it's just, you know, three of us. Um, I just turned the recording on. Okay, perfect. I'm going to be pretty casual because it's just the few of us. So, you know, don't, don't worry. Please interrupt me. And I'm going to sort of meander around and be interesting, I hope. So I just uploaded the handout, which is a PDF in... A second, I can I can bring up the PowerPoint, though it may indeed be overkill for for what we're doing. So let me actually get started by um, talking a little bit about language in Italy. Hang on, just a second. Only let me actually share my screen first. It would help. Um, there we go. I started the slideshow and then I realized I hadn't actually shared. So to start talking about names or pretty much anything in Italy, you've got to sort of back up and think about the situation in period Italy. And some of what I'm about to talk linguistically is still true in modern Italy. So Italian as we know it isn't a period language. That is to say in Italy, there wasn't a single language, partly because there wasn't of course a single nation to bring everybody together, but also because there's just a lot of diversity. And so the language that we think of as modern Italian is Tuscan, right? It is the language of Dante, it is the language, right? And, so on. and because of that, it spreads and becomes the language that's the prestige literary language. But there are also still a lot of differences. There are different languages being spoken. So here's a quick map. So in the upper right, you can see a group of sort of green, yellow things. That's the Veneto, the area around Venice. And still to this day, a different language is spoken there that is sometimes called Veneto. It's often described as a dialect of Italian, but it's really not. These are all separate languages that develop over time. So I should back up and talk about that for just a second. You can tell I'm really organized today. So all the languages that are spoken in Southern Europe and indeed in big chunks of sort of Western Europe are romance languages. That is, they're descended from Latin. So when we think about Latin, there's kind of two kinds. There's the classical Latin that you would have learned if you took Latin in school. And then there's a vulgar Latin. Vulgar, of course, here doesn't mean obscene, but means every day, right? So vulgar Latin developed starting G's actually by the first century, the beginnings of vulgar Latin. But by the fourth century, it's really taken over. And after the fall of the Roman Empire, it sort of evolves into a whole series of different dialects turned into languages that we call jointly the Romance languages. So Romance, as we know, it appears in Italy starting kind of in the ninth or 10th century. Before that, everything's written down in Latin, but then it gets to a point where the Latin is so far from what people are speaking that people begin to start writing things down in this new vernacular. So in this isn't true in Italy, but in Spain, for example, the very first documents in Romance are literally glosses. It's like the Italian, sorry, the Italian, the, 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 the Latin words have gotten so weird that no one knows what they mean anymore. So they're like writing notes, like this Latin word, this is what it actually means. In Italian, that's not what happens. But what we see is gradually the replacement of Latin documents with documents written in this new romance vernacular. And as I said, there are these different sort of dialects that become separate languages. So there's the one spoken in Tuscany, Tuscan. There's what's spoken up around Venice, Veneto. On the border with France in the upper left, there are a group of sort of Franco-Italian. They're sort of really closely related to Occitan, which is what's spoken in France. There are a group of dialects around Milan. So that sort of gray green in the center that red part there is Tuscany. Down below that, there are a group of sort of central dialects spoken around Rome. And then south of Rome, we have a group of, of again, different languages. So Neapolitan, the language of Naples in those sort of blue areas. And then as we get down into Sicily and Sardinia and Corsica, we have still different languages. And of course, these languages still survive today as sort of alternates in almost all of these areas, almost everyone speaks sort of modern Italian, right? That Tuscan descended language, but they speak these other things too. And the reason it matters is because there are differences in the ways that names get formed and there are differences in the ways that choices are made about what kinds of names matter. And some of these differences still come down to the modern day. So 
different languages. This is actually a modern language map, just to be clear. And you can find modern language discussions of all these. And you can find, for example, dictionaries of things like the language spoken around Venice Veneto. Um, but we're going to start with Tuscan because it's the base of modern Italian and because an awful lot of people Wow, that's a really interesting typo. A lot of, a lot of people are really interested in Florence and that should be Pisa um, in the second time and those kinds of locations. So it's an area that people think a lot about. So before we get started with names though, let's, let's make sure that we actually understand a group of, of ideas. So the first one is the idea of a given name. So a given name is the main identifier we use in everyday life like Juliana or Antonio or Aisha, right? Some people have more than one given name. And there are lots of contexts in which people's given names might not be written down, where they might be described as a title, or if we change our attention to Arabic for a second, where a woman wouldn't be identified as Aisha, but rather as, for example, Um, mother of. Right? Yeah, my, my name right? is actually Um Butrus Aisha Alanida, because Um Perfect. Butrus is uh, mother of Peter. That's right. And, in many parts of the Arab world, in many parts of period, your name would normally not have been, your name Aisha would not have been written down normally, it would have just been Umbutros, because that's the polite, respectful way to refer to a woman who's married, who's right in this situation. And in fact, you know, even Aisha, daughter of the prophet, may her name be praised, of course, is known as. Um Abdullah, even though of course she had no children because that matters. So then by names are added identifiers that tell you, for example, which Juliana, right? So we can talk about a group of different kinds of by names. Patronymic by names are one who says who your father is. Matronymics are one who says who your mother is. I didn't talk about ones that talk about who you are the parent of because those don't really exist in Italian, but of course exist in other places. Um, there are marital by names, one that say who your spouse is. There are locative by names, ones that say where you come from or live. It can be a place name or a kind of place like of the hill or of the mill, right? Occupational by names say what kind of job you or your family have. And family names are just inherited by names that now have no meaning. So for example, in the mundane world, my surname is Smith. Now in period, one would expect someone whose name was Smith to be either a Smith themselves or perhaps to be, you know, like the daughter of or the son of someone who was a blacksmith or some other kind of Smith. But in the modern world, we don't think that someone who's named Smith is likely to know the first thing about forging, right? That at that point, it's become independent of any actual, you know, identity. So we're going to use a lot of these things. So we actually have a ton of data from the Italian Renaissance in the Tuscan area because a bunch of people did a whole bunch of indexing of a whole bunch of names. So this is sort of the first part we're gonna talk about is names in 1427 Florence. So in 1427, the um, leaders of Florence decided to do a complete, it's called a catasto. A catasto is basically a special kind of tax roll. And what they did is they went to every household and they recorded the name of the head of household. And then in most houses, they recorded the names of the people who lived in the household. The, there was a big project at a Brown University to index all the households. So we have the names of every single person who headed a household, not just in Florence itself, but in everywhere that Florence controlled. So we have Florence itself. We have the area called the Condado. The Condado is the area right around Florence. And then we have, you know, Pisa and Pistola and all kinds of other places that were actually controlled by Florence too. They went back into this again in the 1450s and in the 1480s, but we only have a teeny tiny bit of that data, at least the folks at Brown only indexed a teeny tiny bit of that data. So what you see on the right here is a whole group of names that were in, that were, that were written down in this condado, uh, sorry, in the condado for the catasto. So these are heads of household, Obviously, there are way more men than women because on the whole, if there's a man in the house, the man is the head of house. But there are a shockingly large number of women headed households as well. So we see lots of examples of women's names too. So the top are men's names, the bottom part are women's names. 
So what we see is we see a given name. It's generally followed by one or more of these kinds of by names that we're gonna talk about in just a second. Rarely there's a second given name. And you'll note that sometimes they actually use titles, things like Mona or Donna, two different forms of Madonna, my lady. And firms like Ser and Messer, again, two different forms of male forms of respect that we use in different ways in different ways. So sometimes we see these as titles. So Mona Bartolomea, um, in other cases, we see, for example, Benedito di Piero degli, no, sorry, not that one, sorry. Not looking at the right part. There we go. Mariotto de Francesco de Ser Senina. So there his grandfather was someone who had that title, sir. Now that doesn't mean he was a knight in our language because of course titles don't, don't map in the same kinds of ways. Um, but we see these in names. So in almost every case here, we see someone described first as the child of their father. In some cases for women, it's the name of their husband instead because all it's saying is of, that's what D means. So D followed by the father or husband's given name. Occasionally we see women's given names and then it changes to just da before a vowel. So Biagio d'Antonio instead of Biagio di Antonio. Sometimes there's another generation. So for example, that one I just said, right? There's two generations, his father and then his grandfather because his grandfather is somebody really important. So it's important that they be identified as who his grandfather is. There's some other data sources in which grandfathers are pretty normal. So in just a minute, we're gonna look at some data that's a little bit later from PISA that's from um, people being baptized. And they're almost always the grandfather's names show up probably partly because of the way that Italian households work. So if you're somebody at all important in Tuscany in the Renaissance, you're living in a pretty large household. And people only come to head these households when they're relatively old. And so the vast majority of people who are having kids aren't actually in their own housekeeping, especially if it's your first or second kid. You're probably living in your father's house because so are the next 30 people, right? These are large households. And so it's not surprising that grandparents matter too because you're often tied there. So we also see in 1427 family names. So family names usually then not always end in an I instead of an O. Did you notice that most men's names in, in, in vernacular Italian end in O? So the usual, most typical family name form drops the O and replaces it with an I. So we see Antonio Filippi, right? So those are people who are descended from some guy named Filippo. It's not his father anymore because it's become a family name, right? Sometimes, most frequently, these just appear just like that, Antonio Filippi. But sometimes you also see them with Deli, which means essentially of the X family. So Antonio degli Filippi would be Antonio of the Filippi family. We also see, of course, famously, right, when you think about the Medici's, you often see it written as DE with an apostrophe after it. And that's just a short form of Delli, or later it will become Dei. They'll drop the L and it won't be sad anymore. Um, you sometimes see forms that aren't changed at all, like Fabro. Fabro means, um, their Fabro means um, blacksmith. And so sometimes you'll see them unmarked. You'll see locative by names that use da or della or dello, or sometimes just del, all of which kind of mean of, or, so da means of, del or dello or della, all mean of the, and then whether it's feminine or masculine tells you which one you use. Um, so that phrases the endless question of all those prepositions. So in Italian names, you see di, da, de, the de with the apostrophe after it, deli, which means of the in a plural form, dello, which means of the in a masculine form. Note that that's different in if you just use the, it's usually ill, but when it goes together with della, it becomes dello or della. So in the standard Tuscan form, what you see is you see D used with patronymic by names, and then it's used in titles. So if you're trying to make a locative by name, you'll see a whole bunch of examples. For example, if you look at a dance book, 
or if you look at a discussion of important people, a huge number of them will be described as D someplace. That's because it's being used as a title. So for example, you'll see the Grand Ducado D Toscana, right? The Grand Duchy of, or the Grand Duke of Tuscany, right? And in that setting you use D, but in normal locative by names, what you use most frequently is Da. Why? I don't know, because it's what you do, right? It's grammar. Um, I'm not sure there's any good reason for it because in fact, in the far South, once you get South of Rome, D's are D is used for locative by names all the time. So it's not like there's something magic about it. It's just in standard Tuscan, this is how it developed. So we see Deli or D-A-G-L-I or D-E-L-L-I uses family names, sometimes day, often that D-E apostrophe, which is, as I said, a shortened form of it. In Latinized contexts, you often see day, D-E in place of all of those. Um, and of course, we use of the, use Dello or Dello. In Rome, they're very, very happy being very, we are the Latin people. And so in Rome, you often see day used instead of dear da pretty frequently. So let's move down a century. It's really not quite, except it really is. So the next thing we're going to look at really quickly is some a study of a town of, of sorry, of names from christenings in Pisa, so baptisms. Now, the reason this moves us almost a century forward, even though it's only 30 years difference, is that, remember, in 1427 in Florence, we're seeing the names of heads of households who are mostly older men and women, because especially people who are out of relatively elite families don't become heads of their own households until they're 40 or even older, right? Until then, they're living with older relatives in many cases. Here, we're talking about babies being born between 1457 and, and even a whole century later, 1557. Here, we see the same kind of pattern. So on the right, we're looking at some actual names. So we see given names followed by one or more by name. Rarely a second given name. There are even some cases of third given names almost always after John forms Giovanni. Um, we see most frequently people described as their father's kid, though sometimes is their mother's kid. So we see things like Antonia di Caterina. So Antonia, who is the kid of Catherine. These are probably in cases where the father isn't on the scene, but it's not clear. It might be in a case where the mother is just from a more important family. She's somebody more significant. At the very least, to completely change the subject, we don't know very much about who these parents are. But for example, there's, a, there's a, been a bunch of really interesting work on the Arabic side, and I'm not just talking about it because, you know, of your name, but also because I've done research there too, where we really do know that parent, there's lots of cases where we know the fathers are around, we know who the fathers are, but people are described as their mother's kid because the mother's just more important, she's more significant, and so she's the one who gets mentioned. But in these cases where the kids are being baptized, it's probably because the father isn't, isn't anywhere to be seen, but we don't know for sure. Stop. Sometimes the grandfather's also included here, as I said, probably because grandfathers are really important for younger people who are having kids. And then we have family names. Again, those usually the family names that just end in E, sometimes with daily. Same kind of pattern that we saw earlier. So not a whole lot of difference. So now let's move a little further south to Rome. This is mostly actually not from my own work. The last bits were actually from articles that I wrote. By the way, there's a bibliography that includes a bunch of them at the end of the handout that I posted. This one is from the work of Mari Inyandonka, who did a great study of a whole bunch of names in Rome. Um, and again, on the right, we have examples of the names. So you can just take a look at what the names look like and how they're written. So again, we're seeing mostly single given names, though some have second given names. Lots of literal patronymic by names, but you'll note D and day just kind of are used in, in great, you know, are used interchangeably. So we see the same guy described in one case as Jacopo di Battista and another is Jacopo de Battista, right? 
The other thing that's really interesting about Rome is that there are more and more names, especially women's names that are overtly classical. So you look at Florence and the vast majority of the names are saints' names. Giovanna, Piera, um, Caterina, Margarita. In Rome, they're named things like Camilla, Camilla right? They have these much more sort of overtly kind of classical names. Um, though also, again, saints' names are really, really kind of typical. Um, so, oops, sorry. Venice is fun. I love Venetian names because Venice is the place where you really see kinds of dialectual differences. So there are a couple of things about Venetian names, and then we can look at some, some sort of collections of names together. So the big thing is that in the Venetian dialect, they drop a lot of those last, um, those last consonants, especially in men's names and in by names. So you see things like Zwan, so Zwa is replacing the J in the Venetian dialect. Not always, you'll see names like Julia, but you also see, so Zwanne, Gianni, but also Zwan. Instead of Daspina, it's Maria Daspin. And so here you actually see some different kinds of things. So just a couple of notes about spelling. Before we go and look at these earlier names, let's take a look really quickly at, um, at some, some samples of these. So these are from the handout because reproducing a whole bunch of names is, is not um, the best thing to do. I still put too much text on the, um, on the handout. So um, let's go back. You hate me, there we go. So as we think about the kinds of names, sort of one of the things that's really interesting about given names. So the big given names we see in Italy, just like everywhere else in Europe are mostly saints names with some classical names, both derived directly from Roman names, the cognomen or the name, those third name that um, those third names in the tria nomina and from legendary figures and then diminutives. So diminutives are a lot of fun in Italian. Sorry, let's try that again. Diminutives are a lot of fun in Italian names because they made diminutives left, right, and center. In fact, in 1427 in um, Tuscany, diminutives of names like Giovanni and Bartolome are actually more common than the base names. So. The first thing that they do to make diminutive names is they shorten the names. So Giovanni, from that you get Gianni, and then also from the second half, Vanni. Then, because that's not enough, they also change them to make the consonants the same. So Vanni becomes Nani. We also see Pippo from Filippo. From Bartolomeo, we see names like Bartolo and Mayo. Then they started adding endings. So things like Inno and Elo and Otso. If you actually go and look, you can discover that these actually have slightly different meanings. So Inno kind of implies little and cute. And Otso or Uccio implies kind of big and, and you know, maybe just a little ugly, right? But they're still used, right? Because of course, over time, things become just names. So from Giovanni, we see, for example, Giovannino, Giovanello, Giovanetto, Giovanotto. But then also, Venuccio, Vanino, Nanino, Giannino, Gianello, Gianetto, Ginotto, Ginuzzo, Nanuccio, Nanini. And at some point, it gets so bad that you end up with names that first they form diminutives, and then from the diminutives, they form short forms, and then they form new diminutives from them. So you'll see names that are things like Detto, and you don't know whether it's from, for example, Bernadetto, or whether it's just from some other random name that ended in D, Bernardo, for example, and Bernardo becomes Bernadetto and then Detto, right? So 
we also see the same thing in women's names. So we see shortened firms like Gita from Margarita, Vanna from Giovanna, uh, Mea from Bartolomea, um, Checha from Francesca, forms with Ella, Nastella, Martinella, Lucina, sorry, Lucina, sorry, let's do it right, Bortolina, Bettina, Petruccia even. Um, and, you know, one of the things to remember, so you see for the last, sometimes you'll find more Latinized forms of the names. So Piero, but also Pietro are found sort of in crazy variants in the same kinds of documents. So it's probably something different going on with the names that we don't know. Um, so, sorry. To give you a sense of what the kinds of names look like, when we look at those Tuscan names, what we see are names that are just the classic saints' names. So for women, names like Giovanna and Caterina and Margarita and Antonia and Bartolomeo and Francesca and Piera and Lisabetta and Jacopa and Nicolosa, right? All sort of these saints' names. Lots of hyper, lots of these pet forms, lots of these nickname forms. When we get to Rome, though. I don't have great examples of um, great sort of numeric stuff, but you see a very different kind of set of names. So you see Clementia, Cornelia. This one doesn't have Diana, but another one has Diana, Diana, that is to say. And so a kind of different set of names. So when I when you think about sort of helping someone or thinking yourself about names, sort of there are different choices of names that sort of make you look really Tuscan versus names that I would look at and be like, oh, that's so Roman. And of course, there are some that you only find even further south, though the collections of those are much less good. Now, what's really interesting to me, and then, you know, we can sort of sit and talk, and then if we get done early, great, um, is that there are big changes between what we see in the Renaissance where, you know, we've sort of looked at a whole bunch of saints names, some classical names, but if we go back a couple of centuries and we look at 13th century Pisa, again, this is a piece that I did. Um, and what we see in 1228 Pisa, where again, this is all men's names because a whole bunch of men signed a treaty. Basically everyone who was, who was a citizen where of course a citizen means a burger, right? Someone who is a person of respect, um, signed a treaty. And so we have thousands of names. And the names that we see in the 13th century are really different. It's Bonacorso and Guido and Ugo and Gerardo. So a couple of the same, Jacopo and Giovanni, Ranero, Arrigo, Ildebrando. Oops, that should be Martino, typo. So here what we're seeing is a different set of names. These are names that are Gothic names. So. Let's go back and think about our history for just a second. So what happens in Rome is as Rome is falling, the people who come in are people who speak various Germanic languages. So Visigothic and Gothic and the like. And with these really different names that are often they're, they're what we call dithemic names. That is, they have two pieces. So, so Ilda Brando. Um, Gerardo and Ranero and Arrigo are all kind, are all also names that come out of this background. And in the 13th century, these are really popular. And then as we enter in the Italian Renaissance, these names still appear, but they're just not very common. And instead, what we see is the great dominance of sort of these big classic saints names. And just to give you a sense of how common they are, the top 10 names in, for example, both in in Venice, excuse me, both in Florence and in Pisa are like 50% of people. That is 50% of the people have one of 10 names, which might be why all those, all those nickname forms exist, right? Literally one in 10 guys is named Giovanni. That's not an exaggeration. In one of the data sets, it's 11% of all men are named Giovanni or some nickname version of Giovanni. So, you know, you got to do something. So, these names are all in Latin, and we see the same sort of set of things. Here, occupational by names are far more common than they'll be in just a little bit. Part of that is about what people do. 
So one of the things that happens across the Italian Renaissance is that more and more people want to be, well, you know, courtiers. That is people who are not making a living by, you know, being a Smith or a tavern owner. And so even people who are in fact Smiths and tavern owners seem to stop using those names as sort of important identifiers and instead simply identify themselves as somebody's kids, right? We see the patronymic by names here, it's Latin. So we don't see D, but we just see the, the father's name put in that genitive form. And you'll note here, these are the same forms as those family name forms, right? So here, Guidi literally means the son of Guido. Two centuries later, Guido will meet, Guidi will mean descended from some Guido way the heck and gone back. And if I wanna say my father's Guido, I say D Guido. Right, often, by the way, even in kind of Latinized forms. But otherwise we see the same kind of names, descriptive by names and locative by names. So with that, I guess what I, what I will do is ask, do you have any questions? Are there things you wanna know more about or things that you wanna talk about? And I'll cheerfully spill my brains about, you know, anything else about Italian names and naming practice that I know. Um, one particular question that I do have is when it comes to having like the, the marked by names, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly for the aristocratic classes, that was the standard, correct? So let's talk about those. So in, in 1427 Florence, somewhere between 10 and 20% of, of people have a family name. Remembering these are heads of household, right? So lots more people each one. So yeah, exactly. Now, remember that, so, so it's a question of who am I trying to say I am, right? So if I'm somebody important, I'll have a family name. If somebody really important, I'll have a family name, right? Sometimes I might not use that family name though, right? So if I am, for example, a Medici, just to pick on them, right? Sometimes I'm just gonna be Lorenzo de Medici. And sometimes I'm gonna be Lorenzo de Geralmo, that is Lorenzo, son of my daddy. And you know, if everybody happens to know who that is, well then, you know, still makes me a Medici, right? But how you identify yourself and what form of your name you use is, isn't as fixed as it is today, right? Because the deal is, in modern form, in the modern world, we're used to thinking of ourselves as having a pretty fixed name. We don't really, because, you know, let's talk about, so mundanely, I'm Julia Elizabeth Smith, only I'm usually Julia Smith. Um, and sometimes, a lot of times, just Julia, right? And so the same thing is true, right, in Renaissance Italy. In Renaissance Italy, if you're someone who's important, you're part of a family. And that family matters. And sometimes you're gonna describe yourself as being part of that family. And sometimes you're just gonna describe yourself as being your father's kid. And sometimes, or, or if you're a woman, sometimes your father's kid, sometimes your, your, your husband's wife, right? Either way. And sometimes you're gonna use that family name, but you almost assuredly have one, right? Definitely. The reason that I kind of bring that up is because I know that we didn't cover Milan specifically, but- right. That is the area that my character is from. Okay. And fun fact, the Sforza family, which were the reigning dukes for most of the 1400s, yep. particularly towards the later part of it, they were one of the few um, ducal level families, at least in my personal research, that mm -hmm. never had a modifier applied to their name when it was written in either Italian or in English. And that was literally how I got my name passed because... Mm -hmm adding the D modifier automatically then makes it, oh, you're not actually claiming to be the family, even though I'm saying that I am descended from that particular family as a bastard of some, and pardon my French there, uh, or as an illegitimate offspring of some generations removed. And mm -hmm. apparently that same trick got passed a few years back. Somebody got it through the, I believe it's the Pelican, it does the names or whatever, or like Pelican, Sovereign of Arms, that within the Culture Hills, it does that. They ruled that, oh, adding the D for Sforza means that you're not actually part of the Ducal House. And so that's how I got it. Right. So one of the things to remember is um, we aren't 
Um, so, so here I'm going to put on my 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 big kid hat, which is to say, um, so so you know, secretly, secretly, all right, not so secretly. I stepped down as Laurel Queen of Arms back in January, and I was Pelican Queen of. Oh, you didn't know that? No, I did not actually. I was Pelican from. To 2004 to 2007. Yeah, that's right. 2004 wow. to 2007. And I took three years off and then I came back and did the thing. So, um, so yeah, I'm one of those big name heralds. So we only treat things as presumptuous. That's our term here, right? When there's no other read for it, right? There's no other way to understand it. So just as an example, the classic example, and I'm not even sure I'd want to defend this one, but I try is that as far as we know, the name Hohenstaufen was only used by the Holy Roman Emperors. It's the only people who used it, not even like cadet branches used it. So that one you can't have because nobody else used it. But Sforza or Medici or Tudor for that matter, lots of people used it. Now, in the case of the Sforzas, it's originally a given name, it looks like. It's a weird given name, but it was, right? family are people who are descended from this dude right and then it was reused right so there are other examples of it being used as a given name by people who aren't sforzas i mean presumably there's some connection i mean like you know just as an example let's go back to the medicis right so medici daughters marry everywhere right including into france and so, you know, when somebody shows up with a Medici connection, in many cases, they don't have the Medici name. And the same thing's true of the Sforzas, right? And so, you know, when some dude shows up and he's using the name Sforza, for example, in 1527 as a given name, not as a by name, not as a family name, but as a given name, there's probably some connection to the Sforza family. But, you know, Lord only knows when or through whom, right? And so... And a name like Sforza, the question is, is it a clear claim that can only be understood as being part of that family or an important part of that family? And the answer is, uh, no, you know. So you could not be, for example, you know, I can't even come up with a good example now off the top of my head <coughs> from Italian, from Italy. That would be clear in that kind of way. I mean, because there were people named Sforza with the family name Sforza and Medici and other places that weren't important people. You know, they had some vague tie to the family. Just like, by the way, my SCA name, right, Deluna. The Delunas are, again, a really, they're not that, they're not high, that high up. Um, my most esteemed ancestor was essentially the equivalent of like um, Wolsey or Cromwell in Tudor England. That is to say, he was a prime minister of Spain, well, really of Castile, because he was he actually served Isabella Catolica's father. And he got, yeah, he got his head cut off because he was just like Wolsey, just like, well, not Wolsey, oh, wow. lived long enough to get his head cut off, but Cromwell did. But my esteemed ancestor, Alvaro de Luna, um, yeah, he got his head cut off because he was got too big for his britches and the king was like, prime minister no more, the block, right? Dang. So, you know, I'm a, not from someone nearly that important. I'm not nearly that important part of the family, but nonetheless, right? So that's why you get away with it is because it's not a claim to be one of those forces. Just like there are plenty of people who are Medici's or, or Deste's or... Um, you know, any of the other important families you can think of, because actually, you know, just a reminder, Medici, Medici is actually even, you know, sort of boring and sad because it comes from medicus, doctor, right? So the Medicis, even though the Medicis were actually bankers, right? Their surname means that they were, you know, barber surgeon types, not somebody important, um, mm -hmm. Right. It's not a it's not a name of someone, you know, because they were they were, you know, folks, all of these. And of course, that's true of all the Italian nobility, all the Italian. Not, well, not all. Almost all of the Italian nobility are sort of these, you know, warlords or important people in a city who kind of convert themselves into nobility and royalty. Right. Very true. And so, so the family names of their family names aren't, you know, aren't are very different from like in France, the family names that are tied to the royal line are all these locative title-based kinds of things. 
and yeah in in italy they're all you know hopped up nobodies it's great and yeah. you know, become grand dukes and you know kings and queens of all kinds of places but they start out as families that are just you know strivers who try really hard so yeah that's where they are um i have a question uh sure. What kind of influence did Spain have in naming uh, conventions in Milan, Genoa, and Naples when they controlled those areas? So I'm going to answer it about Naples because that's the place I know best. In Naples, a whole bunch of Spaniards move in. And so in Naples, you see people who have Italian names and you see people who have Spanish names. And then, the, or, you know, in here, I mean, Spain, I mean, Castilian names. I've never, I don't actually remember seeing in Naples anybody who has a Catalan name, though one would think you would because it's, you know, Naples is Aragonese, it's not Castilian. But just a reminder, right, Aragon is a kingdom in which both Castilian, right, modern Spanish and Catalan are both spoken. I haven't seen Catalan names in, in Naples, which is sort of weird now that I think about it. And so then they go back and forth and you see things that I suspect are Italianizations of Spanish names. So one of the names that shows up is De La Luna, right? Which is literally of the moon, right? Unlike De Luna, right? Which is, Luna is actually, it's a place in Aragon. It's literally, so it's De Luna just means from this one spot in Aragon whose name happens to be the same as the word moon. I don't actually know whether the etymology of the place is the same as the word for moon or not. I don't, or whether it just is a sound alike, right? But I suspect that that's some Italian trying to make sense out of this name. And so you see some borrowing back and forth. And of course, just a reminder, Italy is of course the cultural mover and shaker in the later part of the Renaissance or the, the later part of the Renaissance, the whole Renaissance, right? So that, you know, one of my favorite quotes is um, Carlos, so Carlos Quinto, who was King of Spain at the time is said, to have, is, is said to have said upon hearing of the death of Baldessare Castiglione, right, the author of the Book of the Courtier, that I tell you the greatest knight in the world has just died. Yo vos digo que el mejor caballero del mundo ha muerto, right? That's what he's said to have said. Whether or not he actually said it, I don't know, but it's certainly quoted on, you know, in multiple places, right? So the other half of it is that there's sort of an Italian, um, not so much family names here, but, you know, sort of Italian names become hot in Spain and other places, especially those classical Italian, those classical Latin names, right? Because those two things go together. There's a sort of Latin humanist thing going and people want the names. And then there's this sort of Italia, Italiophilia kind of thing going. And so there's some borrowing back and forth. I don't know whether that also happens in Milan and Genoa. What we do know in Gen, so in Genoa, what we know is there, and in, sorry, in Genoa, it gets messy because there's actually sort of that Franco-Italian thing going on. So we see Occitan names too, which are very like the Catalan names, which are right. But I don't know about Milan. Now I got to go look. That's a real, no, I mean, I just, I've never seen it in Milan, but I've also, Milan is a place, I've just never stumbled on the good Milanese data. There's one article that, um, I think Ariane, we did it. There's an article about Milanese notaries. So there is some data from Milan, but it's mostly earlier. So now I got to go look. But in, in Naples, for sure, there are just flat out Spaniards are moving to Naples and then they're marrying people and they're settling and they're, you know. And so you see this real weird mix. So good question. Um, I also have another question. I mean, it's earlier than Renaissance, but um, Sicily had been invaded by the Arabs and they were there till I think it was like 908 or something, or maybe yep. a little later. A little later, I think. that have any influence on uh, naming conventions and uh, the culture? Yeah, it has. So it has a big influence on place names, right? Just like it does in Spain, right? Where they're all these, it, both Sicily and Spain are just covered with places that have these names that once you dig like two seconds in, you're like, oh yeah, that's actually an Arab name. Um, I do not know of any names that got brought over that weren't used more broadly. Um, and where you see, so there's a lot of crossover in Jewish names. That's the one place where you see a lot of crossover, right? Because 
there are really substantial Jewish populations in the Arab world and also in the Romance speaking part of the world. And, and people go back and forth between those areas all the time. Like Maimonides spent part of his time in Cairo and part of his time in Spain. And so you do see some Jewish women who have sort of these Arabs, Arabic kind of names and some of them end up back in places like Spain and Italy and then those names stick around, right? But in terms of Christian names, it kind of goes the other way, if anything, right? That is, there's more evidence of Moriscos in Spain hanging on, having sort of Christian names, even though they're still probably Muslim and certainly Arabic speaking. But in Sicily, I can't think of any, but now I'm going to go look again for that but I can't think of any off the top of my head that are like that in Sicily, but place names, oh my God, like so many place names. So there are a lot of by names then that are sort of Arab, de Arab derived, right? So good questions. Well, I, the reason why I'm asking is um, my, uh, my family actually was originally from Sicily. So oh, cool. we know a little bit about the language um, which is nothing like Italian, the specific dialect the family. Oh spoke. my God, it's so very not, right? It's oh, it, so yeah. Different. I have, um, so I didn't actually ever do an article about it, but there are a group of um, books that are, so they're about Sicilian Jews. And I was doing this big project on Jewish names, which is sort of how I stumbled into a whole bunch of this stuff. So they, and there are all these documents that are in Sicilian with the names, right? And, you know, I'm so I'm staring at it, I'm going, wow, this stuff is just weird. And I mean that in the most, you know, I mean, I mean that in the best way, right? I mean, that stuff's so different than Tuscan. So oh, yeah. I, I remember growing up and uh, my uh, grandparents and everybody that had come over from the old country They'd sit around and they the gossip they didn't want us kids to understand all the juicy gossip um so when i was a kid i actually understood the dialect i can't do it now but i couldn't i never really spoke it well but i understood it very well because that was right. that was good the good do. the good stuff That's how you get the good stuff <laughs> so i just i i do want to sort of say one thing gently um you know, while, while many of us talk about these things as dialects, they're really independent languages, right? I mean, you know, there's a joke that, a, you know, a language is a dialect with an army. But in <laughs> fact, you know, what's spoken down in Sicily really is, it's not Italian. It's it's completely different language that develops separately. And then Italian sort of moves into that area, right? Because Italian's Tuscan, right? Mm -hmm. Italian is Tuscan, and then it gets moved everywhere else, and everybody learns to speak Tuscan as well. But what they're speaking is an ind is something that developed independently from Latin all the way down, and then they also learn this other thing that came in from outside, as opposed to they learned to speak Italian and then they spoke this different thing, right? So would the process for that be more akin to like, let's just say learning Italian and then learning English as opposed to somebody like me who let's say learned American English going to let's say Australia and learning the Australian right, dialect yeah. English. And yeah this isn't like English versus this is like you know Spanish versus Portuguese and that's a really Spanish and Portuguese is a really good example so Spanish and Portuguese are two completely separate languages we know they're completely separate languages. They are not completely mutually intelligible but if you are a native Spanish speaker, a native Portuguese speaker, and you meet someone who speaks the other language but doesn't speak yours, you'll understand an awful lot of what they have to say. I'm not nearly as good at it. My Spanish is really good, but I'm not a native speaker, and it's one of the places where it shows. So I happened to be in Costa Rica one of the times that the Pope came, went to Brazil. And yeah, they were listening to everything, and they were telling me exactly what was being said. And I was just like, that wow but they could right and so it's kind of like that right again two separate languages that developed independently out of latin came down but there's been a lot of interaction over the years and you know some of the words in sicilian are probably loan words at this point from the from tuscan from you know national italian but a lot of them aren't they're just different and you know even the grammar is different right the endings are different right that so it's sicilian which i do not speak at all so i'm not but a lot of the words that in, in Tuscan end in O, in Sicilian end in U, 
And there's different dialects in Sicily. The one that oh, yeah, I, sure. I know is San Fadan, and the only people that speak it are from you know that town. They're very uh, right. provincial. It's a very provincial area. Right. And those are real dialects. Right. I mean, so I'm happy calling all of Sicilian a single language, but then mm -hmm. all these little local dialects, because there was never a force to kind of bring them together. Right. So everybody learns back in, you know, in the Rena the Italian Renaissance, everyone learns how to speak Tuscan because it becomes the prestige dialect. Right. So somebody who lives in Milan, somebody who lives in Rome, they learn Tuscan because Tuscan is the language of Dante. Tuscan is the language of Boccaccio later. It's the language of, you know, Castiglione and people like that. And everybody learns Tuscan, but they write in Tuscan. They don't speak Tuscan yet. They're just writing in Tuscan because it's what everybody does, right? Just like, by the way, three centuries earlier, people in Spain wrote poetry in Portuguese because they thought it was a better, higher prestige language for poetry. Oh, and wow. All the regular stuff, if you go look, you'll discover a lot. There's a lot of poetry written in Portuguese in the 12th and 13th century by people who are Spanish. So they're writing stuff in the vernacular, right? If they're writing prose, they're writing in Spanish, but you write the poetry in Portuguese because it's better. <laughs> better. And Tuscan is better, right? So, you know, it's what takes over as the national language eventually, but in the meantime, it doesn't. So. Fantastic. Well, since we're at five minutes too, I'm going to stop. Yep, exactly. Thank, Thank you so much. This was fun. I hope you've got some stuff out of it. Um, the handout and the PowerPoint both are living, will be out on the Google Drive so you can grab them. I also uploaded the PowerPoint so you can download it right now if you want to. Thanks so much. It's been fun. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much for teaching. It's been awesome.